This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Welcome to another edition of Silent Voices, the only program here in America that you, the viewer, can express your opinion and tell your story about the child welfare system. I'm Dennis Lawrence and beside me is Maria Malin. Maria? Now we're going to go to our guest portion of this show. We have Ashley Godfrey who will be exposing the scam of psychology psychiatry and the diagnostic ma manual. This is destroying stigmas in people's perspectives, including, but not limited to, CPS and Family Court. Hello and thank you for watching today. I would like to introduce you today to our guest, Ashley Godfrey. Um, she comes to us with issues in the Family Courts and we welcome her today. Thank you for being here, Ashley. Yep, no problem. <laughs> um, Ashley, what would you like to enlighten or educate people on psychiatry and psychology about today? Um, the DSM, billable and non-billable codes. Um, billable codes are diagnosis or disorders. Non-billable codes are called V codes. They're phases of life. Um, these are not billable. V codes given examples of ones that would um, occur in the family court system are V code 62.83 or ICD code 269.82 non spousal adult abuse. V65.49 ICD or ICD. Z69.81, encounter a victim of non-spousal abuse. ICD code 995.82, emotional and psychological abuse of an adult. V code 15.42, child emotional abuse. <clears throat> ICD 10, T74.1, child abuse. Z, I mean, V code um, 61.21, child abuse physical. V code 62.83, non-parent child abuse. V code 61.20, parent-child relationship problem or parental alienation syndrome. V code 62.82, grief or bereavement. V code 15.42 or ICD code Z62.811, personal history of psychological abuse. V code 15.41, personal history of physical abuse, including sexual abuse. V code 61.08, family disruption due to extended absence of a family member. V code 995.80, adult maltreatment. V code 995.81, physical, physically abused person. Um, v code 62.89 or ICD code 265.8, religious or spiritual problem. E codes identify who commits the act. These are non-billable codes identifies the nature of abuse and, and identifies the, in the intent. Um, <clears throat> signs of abuse 
Warning signs of emotional abuse. Excessively withdrawn, fearful, or anxious shows extremes in behavior, extremely compliant or extremely demanding, extremely passive or extremely aggressive, doesn't seem to be attached to the parent or caregiver, um, inappropriate, infantile, rocking, thumb sucking, throwing tantrums, um, <coughs> Physical s signs of physical abuse are uh, withdrawn, fearful, or extreme behavior. Um, injuries on the child, unexplained injuries. Um, other signs of emotional injury are sleeping problems, inability to play as most children do, speech disorders, antisocial behavior, or behavioral extremes, and delays in emotional and intellectual growth. Um, also, the DSM, um, psychiatrists and psychologists both have to label you to bill your insurance. <clears throat> it sounds like you've really done extensive, you know, work on um, checking out all this information, and I'm sure everybody really appreciates the research you've done. Um, it, what is the findings through your research? Um, about the money that the pharmaceutical companies bring in with psychiatric um, diagnoses? Um, $330 billion. Wow. Imagine what we could do if we had that money to take care of children and help rehabilitate parents. Right. It would really make a difference. Mm -hmm. How many deaths annually does this cause? 42,000. Oh, wow. Is that just, and can you elaborate that on just a little bit so everybody can hear Psychiatric what... Psychiatric drugs. Okay. So that's how many people die from the psychiatric Side drugs. Side effects, and you know, or, or like it can cause you to be suicidal. Yeah. And I understand a lot of psychiatric medications mm -hmm. can cause suicide ideations. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> what else would you like to bring to light about this particular information that you've brought today? This money goes to fund pol legislators and politicians that pass laws like you cannot sue for the side effects of anything FDA approved. Um, what never goes off the FDA approved market is psychiatric drugs. Uh, foster children or children with the most V codes. Um, Foster parents and foster homes get more money per label the child has. Um, judges manage to place 20 million children with batters and molesters due to stigmas of mental illness, quote, mental illness, or due to abuse. Now, I've, I've seen that over and over again with protective moms especially, that somebody, whether it be a judge or a social worker or somebody that is supposed to be helping the children, like an attorney for the child, sometimes CASA workers, um, there's various levels. They, they don't have psychiatric degrees, and yet they're labeling both children and parents with psychiatric disorders. Um, yeah, with their psychosocial evals that trigger yes. people's trauma. It's, and it's my yeah. understanding, too, that through the foster care system, and, I, you know, we're not against the people who are out there to do their job and do a good job, but there's many social workers that are appear, appearing to not help the children nor the parents in situations. And it's my understanding that if the child has a diagnosis of some mental health illness or some type of um, previous neglect and they put that diagnosis on the child, they can get more money than they would by just adapting them out without a diagnosis. Right. Is that what you found in your research as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. And what kind of parents exhibit abusive behaviors and aggressive, hostile, authoritarian um, parents? Yeah. Um, that um, the Aggressive, hostile parenting is actually connected to narcissists or sociopaths. Um, 
aggressive, hostile parenting. It is most common when parents are divorced or separated, but it can also occur in situations where a family is intact. Um, and the manifestations of hostile, aggressive parenting are um, parents who constantly undermine the credibility of the targeted parent, interfere in the legally allowed rights of the targeted parent, lie or exaggerate claims to secure advantages in divorce, custody, or protective order processes, exhibits in ordinarily controlling behaviors towards children, former spouses, and others involved, engage others such as friends, co-workers, and family members, and attempts to drive a wedge between the child and the other parent. Um, these children perform poorly in school, fail to develop acceptable social skills, learn to imitate the aggressive and confront confrontational styles of hostile aggressive parent, increases a child's propensity to violent behavior in life later, and also leads to parental alienation syndrome. Now there are different levels of this. Um, let me just step in just for one second. Okay. For those of you who don't know, I worked in the mental health field, and narcissistic personality disorder is quite literally a disorder in which um, the parent who is giving everybody grief and causing the contested custody case are generally people who believe that the entire world revolves around themselves. Um, in general, the they're the type of person that when you ask them about the the children they'll often change the subject and place it back on themselves because they can't see outside of um, their own little world and they quite frankly believe that the whole world revolves around them in a very literal sense and they project everything on everybody else yeah yeah so it ends up being everything's everybody else's fault as ashley has stated and they don't take responsibility for anything i just wanted to give a brief description about that because it is something that we see a lot in contested custody cases. And sociopaths put on a superficial charm and are very manipulative and uh, pathological lying and um, other behaviors. <clears throat> okay. Now there's, there's different levels of hostile aggressive parenting. Um, they will badmouth the other parent in front of the child, not willing to participate in any reasonable form of written communication, will frustrate normal, healthy telephone communication, such as supervising phone calls, um, will say the child does not want to speak to the other parent, will not let the other children speak for themselves, will undermine the other parent's authority, will tell the child they cannot alter parenting times outlined on the court order, because the court order doesn't allow it, will plan, uh, will play on the child's guilt or sympathy, will be uncooperative when it comes to holiday schedules, deny access to children by pretending the child is sick or has too much homework, insist the child be returned on time, will not respecting the same rules, take the children to their own counselors, doctors, etc., without knowledge of the parent, unwilling to consider any um, kind of fair or equal parenting time, not inform the other parent of upcoming school events, activities, disregard, or sell gifts from the parent, will object to the parent taking the child to counseling, attempt to spread hate and to extended family of the target, targeted parent, will threaten the child with loss of love if they choose the other parent, will coach the child to spy on the other parent, will create conflict with the child just after visits um, and the parent, and then blame the other parent for being the cause of the conflict. Severe symptoms are use of excessive discipline, openly violate court orders, tell the child that the other parent is not the biological parent, fabricate false allegations of abuse, force the parent to be supervised when there is no need to be, not allowed communication on Father's Day, Mother's Day, birthdays, 
um, allege that non-custodial parents are responsible for the child's behavior, instruct schools to not provide information to keep the other parent uninvolved, provide schools with information to keep the other parent and family uninvolved, have fits of intense anger, verbal abuse against the parent in front of the child, refuse to speak to children who has sided with the other parent, interrogate the child after a visit, and in critical conditions, which this happened in my case, parents plan to abduct or abduct the children and go into hiding. Okay, and I just wanted to touch on, um, real quick, on the, um, the statement you made that the, there's many parents who really discourage a healthy relationship with a good parent, and that's often the one that gets, um, in my experience in working in this for so long, that's often the one that actually does get custody for the simple fact that that's the parent that's willing to throw the children under the bus. And, um, you know, while the other parent is trying desperately not to harm the child, so you've got one parent who's trying to protect them and mm -hmm. another parent who doesn't care. It's all about abuse, which we know through our experience is all about power and control. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and authoritarian parenting style connected to narcissism. Um, authoritarian parents do not focus on meeting the child's essential, essential or emotional needs. No, they are more concerned with the child living up to adult standards, norms, abiding, consensus values of, and expectations. The behavioral demands on the child is high. The child is expected to behave in a mature way. More or less like a civilized adult. However, despite the child's expectations, the kid is treated like an inferior. An interesting paradox, isn't it? Isn't it? Um, within the conservative rule-oriented parenting style, there is little freedom of thought, creative experimentation, and independent choice making. The means of controlling the child is by force and withdrawal of affection in terms of various forms of punishment. A child will be punished for disobedient um, throwing tantrums and breaking rules. Um, the effects of punishment on the child will be well behaved out of fear, not because of he or she like it is or has understood the meaning of a true positive caring attitude. In this way a child learns to love and accept an acceptance and dependent on good behavior in the way an authoritarian parent is conditional parenting. If I behave, I will not be punished. The effects on kids are low self-esteem and inferior complexes, low self-worth, a lack of basic trust in people, no skills in listening to your intuition, passive attitude in, to their role in life, adherence to rigid tradition and fear of new exper new experimentation um, <clears throat> learn to adopt a dualistic thought par pattern don't know why they what they actually don't know what they what actually like or what they don't like other than what they are being told is good and bad Learning that show, showing emotions is dangerous and gets you into trouble. Learning no skills in dealing with difficult and difficult emotions and frustration. Learning that brute for force, verbal, and physical power is the type of power that is attractive. Incorporate a fixed historical behavioral pattern, which also leads to poor socialization skills. <coughs> And I just wanted to add in there, based on my experience, I've worked with children, that um, a recent incident that I heard a, an abused child say, which they're also extremely, as you said, well-behaved, but I recently heard a, a child who has lived in abuse say, I'm not a people person, and this was something that's been fed into his personality so much that he believed it. <clears throat> I've also had incidences where these children... Um, are living with a parent that's not good for them and they spend all time outside of school in their bedrooms. Mm -hmm. They're not able to socially grow. Mm -hmm. um, the parent who's targeting 
does not want them to become close to people so that they open up and tell people what is going on at home and this this is a really big problem if you're if you're out there and you have your children locked up into their room I would like you to think about that for a few minutes and try to take steps towards gaining a healthy relationship with your children and what's best for them socially um, these children need to grow spiritually socially and in order to do that they have got to have the love and affection of both parents if they are healthy now that being said I wanted to thank you for coming on and you know helping us all understand that exactly what is taking place in some of the court systems and we really appreciate all the research that you've done because there's so many people who know that um, because they've been through it but it's you know what's really important is getting it out to the public so they are aware as well right and okay. before you stigmatize someone look at the reality if you go sit in a psychiatrist chair they have to label you to bill your insurance okay thank you Ashley <laughs> we appreciate you being on silent voices thank you if you would like to be a guest on silent voices contact us at mi parental rights at gmail.com that's mi parental rights at gmail.com i'd like to thank you ashley for coming on the show today and exposing this to us and explaining what's taking place well on a related item legally kidnap has put together a video we like to share with you on the child welfare fraud here it is the anatomy of child welfare fraud Targeted Case Management. Most people have heard of Medicare fraud in the campaign to stop that, but what do you know about Medicaid fraud in child welfare? Medicaid fraud in child welfare? What's that? Contrary to popular belief, the largest federal funding source in foster care is not Title IV-E, nor is it Title IV-A, which is for emergency assistance. It's not even Title XX of the Federal Social Security Act. Well, what is it then? The largest funding stream in foster care is Title 19, or Medicaid, and the area that we will be addressing for the purpose of this video is targeted case management. Targeted case management is considered a pay-as-you-go program. This means that whenever there is a bill in child welfare, it will be paid in full by the feds. Unlike Medicaid federal financial participation, targeted case management in foster care and adoption is 100% covered, which means that the states do not pay any portion. Then a portion of these funds was set aside to suspend regulation called a moratoria on targeted case management. So now we have a basic formula for child welfare fraud. 100% FFP plus moratoria equals the targeted case management revenue maximization scheme. It becomes financially beneficial for the states to place and keep children in foster care than to provide community-based services because there is no regulation of the legitimacy of targeted case management costs. So, what exactly does targeted case management fund? Well, Zippy, exactly what it says. The management of cases from targeted populations. And what is a targeted population? Targeted populations are children who are considered at risk. This means that the likelihood of them being in need of child welfare services is substantial because they meet the following criteria. They could be at or below the federal poverty level. The parents could be minorities. They could be from single parent homes. They could be groups of siblings, or the parents could be unemployed, or perhaps the family could even be living in a low-income neighborhood. The family could also be homeless. And let's not forget special needs children, the disabled, or parents with lack of medical coverage. I'm not really sure that I understand. Can you give an example? Well, Zippy, Medicaid fraud can only be examined after the billing has been submitted and the cost reimbursed. But let me show you what the U.S. Department of Justice identifies as a revenue maximizing fraud scheme. A single parent goes and applies for food stamps or Medicaid. Strike! 
The child receives SSI and is in need of medical assistance. Strike! And the single parent could have more than one child. Strike three, you're out! Of course, these are only the basic factors that qualify a child for immediate, unnecessary, and improper removals. But they are the first stages of the targeted case management fraud scheme. It all plays out like this. The child is placed in a foster home and not with relatives. The child is sent to unnecessary medical and psychological services. The child is billed for non-existent services. The child is sent to medical and psychological services where the physicians have a financial stake in the child placing agency. The shrink for the child placing agency recommends termination of parental rights to the court. The judge has a financial interest in the child placing agency. Parental rights are terminated and the child is adopted. The state continues to receive the child's monthly SSI payment during the targeted case management payment period. Once the child is adopted, the child is issued a new social security number along with a new name, and the states continue to receive the SSI funding under the old social security number. And to think, they get away with this all the time. The complexity of TCM child welfare fraud varies from state to state and from child placing agency to child placing agency, but they exist in a multitude of shapes and forms. Concerns of the pervasiveness of these revenue maximizing schemes have been federally expressed but ignored by Congress. If you know or suspect Medicaid fraud in child welfare, report it. I want to thank you, the viewers, for tuning in this week. You can catch us next time. Same time, same channel. Until next week, my friends. Remember, Remember your, your voice, voice can, can make, make the difference. difference.